Okay, thank you, uh, and thank you all for coming. Uh, this is a topic that's uh, very intensely personal for me. I just got my driver's license last year. But I lived for 15 years in Scarborough, uh, near Markham and Lawrence, which I don't know if you've been there. Uh, but uh, it is a built form argument against mass transportation. Uh, blocks and blocks of winding cul-de-sacs of bungalows, uh, concrete towers uh, on the main streets, and, uh, and huge malls and strip malls at the major intersections. So when I lived in Scarborough, for example, uh, it was not uncommon for my parents to give me a ride to the bus stop because it was a 10 minute walk, right? So this is the scale. And um, much of the suburbs that have emerged around the city and continue to be built today in the post-war period are exactly like that. Um, they are large and uh, they are best experienced from inside an automobile. Um, however, so, so I cover politics at City Hall and the mayor of Toronto has said, you know, he goes to Scarborough where I used to live and people say they want subways, subways, subways. And I believe absolutely that that's true. But um, the the, the, city, the the city itself, as I said, is, is almost an argument against subways. This was built for people to use cars. And so addressing that, building that, changing that, making it a friendlier place and a more sustainable place to get around is one of the massive challenges we have. As I said, um, you know, subways, subways, subways comes up because uh, the debate about transit is probably the biggest debate we have in the city of Toronto right now. And uh, there's a much larger discussion and debate taking place region-wide about transit. And a lot of the public, the headlines in that debate are uh, eaten up by discussions about the mode of transportation. We have the war on the car. We have bikes versus cars, like whether we should put in or take out bike lanes. Um, we have uh, subways versus LRTs. Uh, this is the discussion that we're having, and it's an important discussion, but almost as important or more important um, and almost ignored in the discussions we have about transit is land use. Uh, you can build a subway or an LRT, or you can run buses uh, in areas, but if the built form of the environment, if the uh, neighborhood itself makes, is hostile to the use of public transportation, then it's never going to work, right? So that's my inexpert opinion, but land use is the theme of tonight's talk, and we have some experts who are going to talk about that subject as well. Uh, as cities have grown rapidly over the past century, so have the sprawling, car-dependent suburban neighborhoods that surround them. These current patterns of growth are unsustainable, and they cause wide-ranging social, economic, and environmental concerns, from congestion and longer commute times to increased air pollution, and inactive lifestyles, and I would add uh, social isolation. Tonight, we'll hear from two charrette teams that sought to answer this question. How can we engage, how, sorry, how can we encourage sustainable transportation through effective land use planning? So there's two presentations. Haberbia, there was one group that was challenged to design a model mobility hub that encourages surrounding development and then reconnect the disconnect was challenged with increasing the local and regional connectivity of an isolated suburban GTA neighborhood. So we also have a team of panelists who will comment on the presentations and answer your questions later on. So Christine Alam is a government relations researcher from the CAA. Uh, we were supposed to have Daniel Hofschild uh, from Metrolinx with us tonight, but he is ill, so we are happy in his place to have Christopher Burke, manager of Go Planning. Uh, Hilary Holden is an as the associate principal for transportation consulting and, and transportation consulting leader of Arup, and Rick Hybrecht on the end there is the vice president Smart and Connected Communities for Cisco Canada. So, without further ado, the first presentation will be from the Haberbia Group, presented by, oh, here they are, uh, 
there, oh, there they are. Luigi Ferrara, who is the director of the Institute Without Borders at the School of Design at George Brown College, and Sonny Ray, who's an intern architect with SMV Architects. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, I, I think actually I need to go back there. I, I just want to start by uh, thanking our team that worked on this project. It was an extensive team. And uh, the great thing about that was that they really all participated all the way through to the creation of the final exhibition. So they started with us in the charrette, and then they just kept contributing. Uh, Mara is here. Uh, Juan is here. There's many members of our team. I think Christine was one of our advisors. So uh, this project was exciting to work on because it was really an interdisciplinary collaboration. It's what we promote at the Institute Without Boundaries. But the Mobility Hub Challenge, which, is, which we framed as Haberbia, uh, is really a challenge of how do we create uh, cities in the suburbs. Uh, the great theorist, um, uh, Humphrey Carver, the Canadian great urban theorist, already in the 1950s understood that the suburbs were going to have to be renovated to create cities within the suburbs. And it's something that uh, is uh, really required, and I think more and more required as we're moving forward, to create uh, not only mobility hubs, uh, but really uh, centers for the suburbs that uh, allow them to have a life of their own and to have a full and complete community of their own. And that uh, became kind of a mantra for our team. The key thing that we noticed is that there were mobility hubs out there, but they weren't really working like a center. So we visited Brampton and uh, they have a bus terminal and then next to it is a library and next to it is the municipal, uh, the regional facilities and then there's a mall, but it really doesn't come together as a place. It's a bunch of things next to each other. So that made us start to think about what would really make a place and how would we handle that transportation differently to make a place with the transportation design and with the public space. And so we came up with the idea of V-City. And V-City is really uh, this idea of a new lifestyle, which we call the Herburban lifestyle, which was combining, uh, if you think of the traditional suburbs, they combined the best of city living with country living. And they were really an environmental project when they were started. So what we thought of is combining the best of suburban living with the best of city living and creating a new type of lifestyle that uh, would be uh, sustainable, because if you build a city everywhere, you won't have a sustainable city. But if you built a hubbub, uh, surrounded by suburbs and connected to the cities and uh, in a network of uh, suburban uh, locations, you might actually have something that uh, would be sustainable and uh, would reduce everyone's uh, environmental footprint as well. And we thought that it was really all about, and our future is all about, moving from an ownership model, which is what the suburbs were about, to a sharing model. And so, uh, you know, the, the art of making art is by putting pieces together. This is the Georges Seurat with all the little dots, and yet somehow they come together into a great whole. Uh, and we felt that uh, the art of making cities was about putting people together, not necessarily bus terminals or uh, libraries, you know, but people and getting people to come together. And so we developed V City. And uh, part of uh, our site for the project was the new city centre of Vaughan, which is this uh, wonderful opportunity where the new subway is going to cross with the, um, the busway from the York Region Bus Rapid Transit, the Viva Transit, and it's really where York Region and the City of Toronto are intersecting. And there is this land that is a pretty blank slate that can become a new model for a new type of living, a new lifestyle. And so we thought that rather than people independently planning, we had to bring people together to plan together. So the idea was that citizens, business, and government would work together in a shared plan. Right now, you've got one developer doing a plan, another developer doing another plan. And of course, when everyone's working on their private plan, there's no public space. So the only way to get the public space is to actually get people collaborating around what that public space might be like. And you can see the site. It's, there's the 400, there's the 407, there's Highway 7, and the site is basically an island surrounded by the train tracks, the highways, and then the industrial land to the north. 
And now our response to that, and I'm going to hand it over to Sunny to describe it in detail, but was not to make a bus terminal, but to make a spine that would be, create an interchange. And Sunny's going to start describing that. <coughs> The key to making a successful mobility hub will be for a significant investment in the public realm. Civic investment is needed to stimulate the beginnings of an urban place through the creation of a high quality public space. This high quality public space will inform the beginning of V-City. The existing site has a very robust highway and road infrastructure. The addition of the subway and the bus rapid transit line along Highway 7 will bring together a new type of infrastructure to Vaughan, mass transit infrastructure. Public transit involves pedestrians moving about on foot, connecting with subways and buses. There's a potential for a vibrant public realm due to the introduction of thousands of people moving to and from the mobility hub daily. Enhancing the relationship and experience of pedestrians arriving to and from the hub is critical to the success of the new downtown. The mobility hub is the space that can offer a means to get somewhere while also offering a chance to shop, meet up with a friend, or linger about and watch the daily ritual of movement. It is a space to connect to one's community as much as it is to connect to transportation. This is a section through the mobility hub. Uh, we saw the, the V-City mobility hub as a layered space. Uh, this section shows uh, the mobility hub as we've seen it at full build out. Uh, we can see the subway tunnel and the station that are currently under construction, as well as our vision for a type of public space that will inform the future of V-City. The Viva bus rapid transit line along Highway 7, the subway station, and the mobility spine form the first pieces of the mobility hub. The City of Vaughan is currently proposing a bus terminal building and an underground tunnel connecting it to the subway. Although this is the best way to provide the fastest and most efficient means of connecting two modes of transit, it's hardly the most urban. Instead, we propose stretching out the bus station and creating a spine that is both a place for buses to drop off passengers as well as a space for pedestrians. The, the mobility spine becomes the public space and is the armature for which, on which V-City grows out of. Connected to the pedestrian spine is a green spine that provides a green meadow throughout the extent of V-City. As the foundations of the public realm have started to form, the first pieces of the private sector investment can be introduced. Uh, this is a view from the pedestrian spine looking north, or looking south, sorry. With the investment in the public realm established, the role of the private sector becomes important in enhancing and activating the downtown. The mobility spine is not just the armature for pedestrian movement and civic engagement, it is also the armature for private investment. The success of E-City is dependent on both the public and private sector working together on a shared vision with the public sector taking the lead. With the addition of retail, commercial, and civic institutions into the hub, we see uh, a public, helm, uh, public hub uh, animated and framed. The mobility spine becomes the Vaughan's urban living room. The residential buildings are planned with courtyards as shared semi-private space. The courtyards are filled, I'm sorry. The courtyards are, are linked with cycling and pedestrian paths that also connect like tentacles back to the mobility spine. One of the big challenges with this site is the high water table that sits between four and five meters below grade. This makes underground parking a real challenge. Our scheme proposes placing parking above grade at one end of the courtyard with retail and civic fun functions at grade, creating a building that separates pedestrian and cycling movement from the car. The small scale has a critical role in V-City. The role of small scale businesses and entrepreneurs is critical to help activate the public realm at the pedestrian scale as the development of residential employment investment grows. So you'll see sprinkled on the site are uh, startup pods and kiosks, which Luigi will explain in greater detail later. These are spread out throughout the spine on the undeveloped lands. These startup pods and kiosks provide public space, or provide space for smaller businesses and innovative enterprises that start taking root within V-City. They are a pivotal piece of the success of V-City to help move on past the big box retail hinterland that it currently is known as. Startups can take advantage and capitalize on the influx of thousands of pedestrians that will eventually move through V-City daily. The mobility spine acts as part of the stormwater management system, leading surface rainwater runoff to a stormwater management facility. The public space to the east of the spine slopes down. You'll see that towards the, uh, the pond. 
Black Creek is currently used as a stormwater retention pond, but it's at capacity. The major reconstruction is planned to extend this capacity, but our vision sees this reconstruction uh, linking up with the mobility spine. So I'd like to describe a little bit of what the life in this new suburban world would be like. And it's based on the idea that a lot of the services that we would have would be shared and that a lot of the spaces would be held in common. So when you would buy uh, a unit and live in um, Haberbia, you'll notice that uh, your unit would have a garden in the sky, you'd have public spaces at the grade level, and you'd have uh, actually furniture that was robotic and that would actually move around and be rearrangeable. So it would be, uh, you, it would follow you around, you'd be able to reset it up, and uh, the idea is to create objects that are intelligently in uh, communication with you and with each other. So um, if you're going to leave your unit and go down and walk down to uh, the mobility spine, which you can do, but you're carrying a bag, you can just order one of those uh, little benches and it'll follow you as you're walking and you can put your thing on it and then it'll become a bench in the spine. So the idea is rearrangeable furniture. In this case, you're seeing the meadow and the meadow's been inhabited and it's being used by a lot of the shared services and facilities that are in, um, in uh, the V-City. Here in the spine, you can see that there are uh, supports for uh, businesses, for showcasing, and you can see the relationship between the spine and the meadow and the residential and um, the commercial spaces. They're all mixed in together. And if you'll notice on the roof, you'll probably see um, some farms. This is the library building, which is a public institution, but the idea of it is uh, not a typical library where you, know, you have a central place, you walk in one door. The idea is that there are actually units that are all accessed and citizens uh, can leave their books there, uh, they can work and study there, they can set up little businesses using the library. It's, it's every little module is actually uh, owned, uh, not owned, but used by the citizens and shared amongst each other. Here you're looking down at the spine and you can see how you can basically walk along the spine and uh, along the meadow and get to the spine and you can see the lifestyle in the units, you can see uh, the arboretums on top of buildings and you can see we have a building at the end that actually basically the roof slopes up and the landscape climbs up over the roof and you can use it for skiing and other things like that. So the idea is to include everything and make it as complete a city as you could imagine. And so these are uh, the filling out of the building and the cities over time. So here you see um, the spine, the library, the public park, the buildings, uh, informal gatherings that are happening, um, and the citizens basically using the space and prioritizing pedestrians and active transportation over vehicular transportation because of sharing, right? Because uh, in this uh, development, you'd have a shared car, you'd have shared bikes, you'd have all sorts of shared facilities and it would be part of what uh, you get when you buy into the development. So you see the roof has a shared agricultural garden so that actually part of your buying in is to have uh, from the garden that's run on the roofs a certain amount of fresh food uh, weekly, either from the greenhouses or from the urban farms on the roof. Some more images of that. So you can see the courtyards, the rooftops, and the, the roofs on top, and the public spaces. So while the density is very high, there's a lot of green, and there's a lot, uh, it's a pedestrian oriented place that has nature as well as urbanity. So it's really trying to combine the best of a suburb and the best of a city. And then you can see the communal spaces are open and accessible to everyone. And they're part of the public spaces. So they're animating and bringing life. Things that are usually hidden and privatized, like swimming pools, etc., are brought forward. And then everyone who's a member of the uh, community can use these facilities. And here's it building out over time until you get a full hub. So what are the principles? So the idea is a layered mobility hub following 
followed by inclusive planning that includes everyone in the planning, including the community and community engagement. Investment in artful public space, in other words, making beautiful public spaces that people want to be in, and using sustainable infrastructure. And then by doing that, you accelerate the private investment. And the idea, we came up with things that really typify the lifestyle. Exchanging, sharing, playing, growing the food, dwelling together, learning, and connecting. Sort of a 21st century conception of city life. And we came up with actually a kit of parts um, that you would use. So you'll see in some places, you'll see the skis or scooters. These are, uh, these are all uh, public furnishings that are available. So rather than having to own your own skis so that you, know, you need like a huge basement or whatever, there's actually little pods that have the skis. And you just swipe your card, get the skis, use them, and then put them back, and then someone else uses them. So this is really rethinking how we live, because right now we live thinking that we have to own everything. And we have to have a separate everything. When how many times a year do you use your skis, right? So the, re the reality is, is that the things could be more shared, that you don't have to own everything. But what you have to learn is the art of sharing. The art of sharing means that when you use the skis, you have to put them back properly, right? And that you have to actually respect things. So it's starting to create a sociability of how do you share with other people. And so these are the principles that we came up with for suburban life. So one is that generations mix. Unlike our cities where we're zoning people, you know, children into one quadrant, seniors into another, uh, there should be a mixed generations. Everything is within walking distance. So you, even a farm is within walking distance. Parks, farms, streets, and buildings collide, which is not something that's happening very often. Smart services are shared. Food is fresh and locally grown. Citizens produce and consume their own energy. So there's a whole energy plan within the buildings. Living, working, and playing converge. Creativity is at the heart of the community. So that new institution, that library, is really about creative space for learning and working. And innovation, business, and collaboration are incubated. So actually, the library becomes a place that is incubating new businesses and new ideas, because ideas are the currency of the future. And finally, all the hubbards are connected with each other so that you can get to them very easily by public transit and not have to use your car as much. So how would we do it? Well, you'd start by from 2010 to 2015 planning together rather than planning separately. And so you develop a parking authority with a community development agency, and you develop a pedestrian scale network and some green vehicles. From 215 to 25, you'd make connections, incubate creative small business, invest in public space and leisure, and connect beyond the limits. And from 25, 2025 to 2030, you'd attract the commercial, you'd do public-private partnerships to build the civic institutions, and you'd build out the neighborhoods. And from 2035 to 2040, you'd basically have your, your overall vision. And this would become, we believe, a creative center for the region, which is really, the region is really missing it. it. There's no place in York region that has that feeling of a creative place that's generating the future. These were just some of our precedents. The important precedent was what they did in Montreal with the uh, Quartier des Spectacles and the Quartier International. They used a planning process where they started with a planning investment by the public, realm, by public sector. Then they did an investment in public space which then led to $2 billion worth of private investment. So rather than starting with a private investment, you start with public investment. So the idea is to plan together, create an artful center, and build the first hub in the region. There it is, Huburbia. OK. OK. Thank you, gentlemen. You had me at robotic furniture. <laughs> Hello, test? OK. Uh, so we'll have comments from our panel. Well, the way we're going to do it is, uh, I think, you have about five minutes each to respond, offer some reflections. And then after all of the panelists have weighed in, then you'll have an opportunity to maybe offer some closing reflections uh, 
addressing the panelists' comments. So uh, who wants to start? Why don't we start at this end, Chris? Thank you. Well, congratulations on the team uh, on a very creative uh, approach to, uh, to this challenge. Um, as having a greenfield site, some people might say that uh, makes it easy, but in fact, you're starting from scratch. So um, uh, sometimes when you have a, a blank slate instead of having set pieces in front of you, uh, it, um, it can be an even greater challenge. Um, the things that intrigued me uh, by the concept um, uh, included uh, putting the people first and starting from that angle and, and working your way into the different pieces of the concept uh, and the creative space in, in particular and, and the idea of a library growing into something that um, is probably a hybrid of a whole bunch of different institutions. My wife is a librarian, so uh, it uh, rang true with some of the uh, arguments we've been having about the role of, of institutions like that in the community and how they keep up with the times. Um, uh, one of the questions that I would um, ask is, so here we are starting from a situation where, um, Yes, it's a blank slate in some respects, but there is development there. There, and some of it's actually fairly uh, high rise uh, you know, on a couple of the properties. Some big box knockdown stuff with parking lots, um, and a lot of automobiles. And um, the the phasing kind of approach, um, the um, not so much the approach of starting with the public space and moving to the private uh, development. I think that that is a great concept but more over time, sort of how you get there. I'm a little worried about um, that it takes so long to get to the part where you consider the community to be vibrant um, and that it's, it's putting a lot of the public pieces together but the city itself may not come together. How do you meet that challenge of making sure that in the shorter and medium term that um, you're um, coming up with something that it that itself in its incomplete state is attracting those people to create that life to take advantage of the transportation uh, connectivity that's there. All right, so I was on this team, well at least the charrette, so it's nice to see the final product is not what I, everything that I remember, I guess you've added a lot of components. Um, for me, I think not so much questions, but maybe picking out a few things that I think the team would like to highlight that we'd like to hear about. Um, part of it about the creative idea. Where did that come from? And I know it's centered around the industrial areas and stuff, and I think it'd be nice to highlight the reasons why that's a component of part of what we created. Um, another thing, uh, the, all of the, the bus connections, I think someone right here next to us might have some good feedback on how that was rooted. It was a, a lot of changing conversations about how it could be done um, in terms of what it looked like as well as how it functioned to a trans like a transportation engineer. So that balance between that I think was the two things that I wanted to highlight for you guys. Thanks. Okay, well I come at this from a sort of transportation perspective so it's really interesting to sort of look at the, the land use and the transportation interaction and this is a very rare opportunity where you have a new subway, sta subway station which how should I say, Arup had a role in designing but it's, it's sitting there and it's a, it's a real beautiful structure and it's how do you then build a community around that and that's the real challenge and it's a real rare opportunity for us to, to, to be looking at the options and what's available. Um, what I really liked about this is that it, it um, gave people space to be able to understand their environment and the community that they're, they're joining. So it's having that vista to be able to navigate and to be able to locate yourself within a community was, was really interesting. And I really liked the idea that you've, you've got a hub which is actually within green space and you, people think that you need to build over, build adjacent to, and actually to give it space and have that in the centre gives people something that they can belong to. Um, I'm very conscious that mm -hmm. I came to Toronto two years ago and in terms of where I decided where to live, or well, my husband decided where to live, is that we um, look for the biggest green space on the map, which happened to be High Park. And we didn't really mind what we lived in, but we know, knew that we wanted to live near the city, but we wanted to be able to have all the, the, 
countryside, so to speak, all the amenities of, um, of being near the park. And so to have that is so important, I think, in terms of how people make their decisions. And this is within the context of GTHA, which is growing and growing very fast. And we've got people from all over the world who are going to be moving here. And we need to understand what they are used to, which isn't necessarily what a lot of people who've been living in Canada would see as the ideal of the future um, of, their, of where they will migrate to in terms of as their family grows or as the children leave home where they actually want to be living. So there's a whole global um, uh, aspiration of where people want to live and I think that's really been incorporated into this and I think it's really interesting and really important to be able to be providing for what people want within the new developments because a lot of what we've got will be existing communities within the GTHA and we there is a challenge to serve those existing communities of Scarborough etc and we need to do that we need to route bus services through there but we also the separate challenge and very distinct challenge is to be able to accommodate the growth which is going to happen and this is the most perfect site of the growth that's going to happen there are other sites that are looking that developers perhaps own, that they want to develop, that don't have this beautiful transit connection. And so for them, the challenge is even harder, but for here, it's, it's how do you get that challenge right? And the other question I want to, to sort of talk about, because it's my, my pet when it comes to mobility hubs, is the role of employment. Because I think that if you get employment at these locations, in these suburban, suburban locations, um, you start to adjust where people live. And people live where they can get to their work, usually. It's a really big factor in terms of where people decide to choose to live. And so if you can make and you can connect them to each other, people will choose to live in one and work in another. And you start to get these connections that are orbital around the city, and then it takes the pressure off the coming to the downtown core to make the connections across the city. So the role of employment as a, as a catalyst, as whether they come in early and you get big employers locating and developers actually looking at employment rather than residential as the, the anchor in these hubs. Um, sorry. I, I thought it was great. I, I live in uh, Markham. That was my wife's choice. And it was a lot of green, green space when we were looking around, not anymore. Um, so I, I think it's great. I like the whole notion of, and you call it a ritual of movement, the coming together of roads and transportation and water and people. And I'd like to, I mean, I, I kind of have to, right, add bits and bytes, which I think is a lot of uh, underlying uh, concept, it seems like, especially where the robotic furniture came in and how we, we use technology and innovation to enable a lot of these concepts. I think the challenge, and I think this is probably why it has to take 40 years, is it's built on the premise, the fact that people are willing to share. And I don't see that happening in my lifetime, that we share skis and then leave them behind, and we all are good about that stuff. But I think maybe it takes a place for people to re, um, appreciate our stuff differently, and, and that may be it. Um, I'm curious to hear about how um, how we avoid that this becomes the new downtown and that now we, we still have a lot of people living around these areas that don't have these amenities that now have to come in and we keep, keep growing that out and this, we just move the problem up. Mind you though that maybe downtown empties out because now I don't have to go downtown anymore and I can go to Vaughan and work probably as effectively as, uh, as opposed to from our downtown office. So. The key question through all this is probably around people and, and use, using this and, and their behavior, which ties into, I think, your concept that I think is very valid from the beginning, that is the whole plan together. And I think from our perspective, when we look at uh, projects that we're involved in that in, in, uh, deal with transportation or infrastructure, I think often that is certainly lacking. We do all think in silos, and if we all would kind of break out of our silos and think outside of the box and charrette like you do probably in your environment all the time, I think we get so much more innovation clearly um, and probably so much more productivity coming out of it as well. But it was great. I liked this. Thanks. Okay. So did you guys want to take a few minutes to address some of those questions? I'll actually respond to the first uh, comment. I think one of the things we realized as a team was that you're going to get the subway, and you're going to get the bus rapid transit line. 
but the build out is going to take a number of uh, decades even. Um, so our kind of uh, response to that was to create these kiosks and small scale uh, retail outlets, uh, bars, restaurants uh, that could provide um, the exchange. Um, one of the problems, I live in Vaughan actually, I live in Woodbridge, and so from downtown to home, uh, there is no place for any exchange to buy groceries, to do dry cleaning. Uh, so that's, that's one of the big uh, kind of issues that we were trying to deal with, and we didn't get a chance to explain it because there were so many layers to deal with, but that, that was one of our uh, kind of main objectives was knowing that the build out was it was a number of years uh, this these kiosk and uh, small scale incubators uh, could provide the gap between uh, the rest of the build out hidden in the drawings are these uh, kind of almost like container like uh, megaplexes that would be kind of uh, built and then as development came then you would remove them so the idea was to use a lot of temporary structures as well um, and I think this is coming back to the idea that uh, Christine wanted us to talk about because the reason we came up with this idea was in the industrial areas around there, there's like the, like the best baker, uh, the best uh, uh, stone uh, carver, the best uh, this, and they're all just hidden in industrial areas. So the idea was also like, could we create showcases so that you would know where that person was because in the middle of the hub, we would have these glass kind of pavilions that would have an installation of what they do, right? So if Chiat Tiles is up there and has the best tiles, they could actually take over one of these little pavilions around the space of the hub and have a display and then say, we're just you know, down the road and, and uh, you know, you'd you know, swipe with uh, your phone and you know, from the RFD or whatever tag and then you, you would, it would tell you on Google Maps where to go. So the idea was to make visible in the hub what's in Vaughan. So the and kiosk wouldn't follow you around. <laughs> no, we didn't have moving kiosks. We didn't go Archigram. We, we just had uh, simple things that would move around, which we have in the exhibition, if you want to see. We have a, a prototype, which was kind of uh, um, a furnishing that was either a bench or a um, sort of covered, uh, 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 a covered kind of, bench that would walk with you and protect you from the rain. Uh, the, um, but the idea of robotic furniture was, it's there as a symbol more of how to use uh, technology in an interesting way and trying to create, use technology. Because one of the reasons car sharing didn't happen, it was something that was thought up, it was actually thought up by Canadians in the 70s. Um, and it, one of the reasons it didn't happen was that we didn't have the information technology to monitor the network, right? But with this kind of information technology that allows us to monitor the network, we can move towards models of sharing. And we do think that it's gonna be a number of generations before people really do it. But uh, interestingly enough, when we, one of the other teams that we had, we had reps from Magna, and they had totally underestimated how much people under 24, because uh, they went out and surveyed, people under 24 want car share. They don't wanna buy a car. Because when you have car share, you own three or four cars because you could get your van, you can get a this, you can get a that when you need it. So it's, there's that generational shift happening that, um, that actually could be reflected in a new way of living. And uh, to the point about like, you know, will this replace the old downtown? Um, I, I think in a way uh, it can serve as a model, uh, you know, in a weird way when they built Don Mills, it served as a model of how to make a safe green neighborhood uh, for families, right? If Vaughn builds something like this, it could serve as a model for how to have uh, more intensity spread throughout the region rather than everything focused on the downtown, which would also relieve the downtown from over-intensifying. Because right now, what's the trend that's happening is that everyone is moving towards that downtown. If you look statistically, it's what's happening. At the Institute Without Boundaries, we were working with Markham because one of the things that's happening is they're losing people to the downtown. They're even losing companies now to the downtown. So we could actually be going into the reverse effect of having all our suburbs uh, really empty and our downtown really vibrant. And really, you want what you need is more like cities that have spaces between them that are interconnected quickly, more of a, a network. So that's what we were trying to imagine. We we're trying to imagine what would the implications be in that lifestyle. 
do we did we touch on everything? Did, 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 was a are we satisfied that there's enough of an employment base in the Hubbard to uh, to support vib vibrant vitality? No, did you? Yeah, that's another uh, issue that we're trying to to look at. Uh, sorry that I missed that point. Um, and thank you for liking the point of keeping the space between the buildings because a lot of the stuff that's happening is trying to isolate and put everything underground. The um, the idea of actually having a lot of incubation uh, happening on the site is intended to generate over time those employers because it's not going to be so easy for the town to just attract the employment to an empty site. It might be easier for them to attract it to Markham where things aren't so empty. But here is a city trying to make a new downtown. How are they going to land people? And the problem is you could give away everything to try to land peer people uh, and working there, but maybe the thing, the trick is the opposite, to grow a new generation of companies. Uh, um, uh, because there's actually, uh, interestingly enough, uh, the, the TD branch at Highway 7 and uh, Weston has something the, uh, like uh, $4 billion in savings. This area is crazy because there's all of these immigrants who are living there who have incredible savings. So you could unleash and invest in local new businesses that would uh, you know, m become big businesses eventually. But then that takes time as well. Any further thoughts? I guess just just a, a last comment. I guess the, the idea about sharing, uh, I know that's a, that's a big leap to go from uh, the sharing of the skis. But I, I think the idea, the underlying idea was that the mobility space is shared space. And the idea of like unleashing and not having a bus terminal, but having a spine where the buses could drop off and there could be this kind of fluidity of people moving and the transportation moving and all these things crossing. Uh, th that's the kind of space that doesn't exist in those places. I don't know if it, what it's like in Markham, but there's definitely no a place where you can have that exchange with people. And I think that's the kind of, uh, the, the key generator was, was uh, providing this space, which is lacking. You just hang the skis on the back of the Bixie bike. Right? You swipe this way, you take the bike, and they swipe that way, take the skis. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, and, I, and, I, and I think, just my own comment would be that I think you're right that there's a general shift, generational shift taking place. And I think it's sort of gradual, but a, um, technology has really driven the open-mindedness of people to that, too. Uh, when car shares first were introduced, I was reluctant to the idea because if I want a car I want it available to me and I don't want to have to sign up two weeks in advance to run to the grocery store right but um, we've now signed up for two car sharing services we also own a car but uh, we have lots of people um, uh, two car sharing services that we use infrequently and some of them operate almost as taxis right it's like there's a green pea at the end of my street it's always got a couple cars in it I can drive it downtown and I only pay like three bucks and then I just leave it in another green pea, and somebody else might take it, but there's always a car there, and it's like the, those kind of things, and the technology that enables them to do that has suddenly made it make sense in a way that it, it didn't to me before, so, yeah. Anyhow, uh, thank you very much, and thanks to the panelists. We have another charrette presentation, but we're gonna take a few minutes to set it up. So we'll take a 10-minute break, um, 10 minutes at the outside, five to 10 minutes, but we'll say 10. Uh, and uh, there is a reasonable, very reasonably priced water available at the back, um, uh, so you can have some of that. There are washrooms on your right just down the hall here, and then um, there's more exciting presentation to come. <laughs>